chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation. I'll invite everybody to finish the travel down. It's a gorgeous day. And um, let's see. there are main tags over there. There's a silent auction, and there's food and coffee. Um, so please feel free to get whatever you need at any point during the presentations. Um, first, we're going to have, um, after the, the excellent Chestnuts 101 by Brad, um, we're going to have a quick national meeting roundup. So we're one of um, approximately 15 state chapters, and there's a, um, an umbrella group which is, consists of paid staff, a research farm, facilities for um, microbiology down in Virginia, and the Nashville, North Carolina um, office. We have an annual meeting every year. Um, and this year, there were some of the highlights for a number of particularly excellent student presentations. So for those of you who are educators who have students doing local research, please um, consider encouraging your students to get together posters for these national meetings, which will be just getting uh, larger from this point forward. Um, we also had one of our um, board, local board members get an award. Um, so Brian Clark uh, received a volunteer award. Uh, but like he's already standing. So. <laughs> Excellent um, scientific uh, presentations. These are online if you're interested in seeing the topics. And um, with that, I'll just wrap that up and we can go to the um, New England Regional Update by Kevin Gurney, who's a regional science coordinator. So I think I'm the only thing standing between you guys and the chestnut potluck, so I don't have to work on for too long. So I think I'm going to be covering our New England update, just sort of giving you some highlights of the group. Like, I know Brad gave a good, a good overview of the breeding program and go into a little bit more detail about what our chapters actually do with that breeding program, the physical work that happens in our volunteer chapters. Give some highlights from our other New England states. We have chapters in, in all of our New England states at this point. Uh, and then we'll transition and really do some uh, more detailed uh, investigation of what happened in Ambassador Island this summer. It was a very busy field season. So, first off, just to kind of go over our breeding program, our mission is to restore the American chestnut to Eastern Forest. So, how do we actually do that? Uh, the main mechanism that the Chestnut Foundation is using to restore American chestnut is a backdrop breeding program to bring light resistance from Chinese and Asian chestnuts into American chestnuts. And the goals of that breeding program are number one, to develop light resistant American chestnuts to ensure that they're regionally adapted. The range of American chestnut covers about 200 million acres from Maine to Georgia, and Georgia is not very similar geographically and um, environmentally to Maine. So, how do we ensure that regional adaptability? And then finally, how do we ensure long term resistance? We don't want to put out a tree that in another 10 or 15 years is not going to uh, cut it anymore. So, in terms of how we breed light resistant trees, most of this is guided by our current breeding program, which as it stands now takes six generations, at least on paper, uh, to get through. We start with a cross between Chinese and American chestnuts, where we capture blight resistance uh, from the Chinese chestnut. Then we go through three or sometimes four generations of back crossing to new American chestnut parents. Now the way blight resistance is inherited is that it's incompletely dominant. So you need it to come from both parents to be fully expressed. And and in any of these early generations, the Chinese chestnut parent and then the F1 or, or first or second F cross parent is the only place where you're getting light resistance introduced to that cross. You're not getting anything from the American chestnut. So even when we get to this stage, the trees will be at best moderately light resistant. But we're hopeful that we're doing a good job at selecting trees that at least have that moderate level of light resistance and have good American chestnut characters that are going to look and act more like an American chestnut than a Chinese chestnut. But then to boost our blight resistance, we actually start crossing hybrids with hybrids. And uh, we do that for two generations to hopefully fix blight resistance in the offspring so we can be pretty confident when we put them out in the forest that that blight resistance will hold up. A 
again, this makes perfect sense. It works really well on paper, and in practice, there's a lot of uh, room for, um, for wiggling around a little bit. But that, that's our main mechanism. A lot of that work is completed at our Meadowview Research Farm. We've all mentioned that we do have an overarching organization um, that kind of helps guide our, our state chapters um, and our, our reading program. Um, I'm the only staff person in New England. Our Meadowview Research Farm is one of our bigger <coughs> locations that actually has a few staff folks. And they've been reading since 1989, working on a couple different sources of resistance. Uh, they really work to adapt their cultural methods to be able to bust through the reading pretty quickly so we can actually get flowering trees in two to four years. Um, nice to have the farm staff and equipment to be able to do that. Our volunteer chapter, we don't typically have that kind of uh, um, speed. But uh, we have about 34,000 trees on 150 acres in the Meadowview, Virginia. So if you ever want to see chestnut trees, if you're in Southwest Virginia, this would be a place to go. Uh, but that's just how we develop, that's sort of our method, okay? So we've got the method, how do we ensure regional adaptability? Meadowview is one little speck of the map in Southwest Virginia, kind of out in the middle of the chestnut range. This is where our state chapter programs come in, and this is a really integral part of our program. We couldn't really do what we're proposing to do without having great work going on across the range of the American chestnut. So we have 17 state chapters from Maine to Georgia. Um, as I mentioned, all the New England chapters have, or all the New England states have chapters that they can participate in. And their main task is carrying out the breeding program using local trees, so finding those uh, existing American chestnuts they can incorporate in the breeding program. Uh, so they do a lot of work hands-on work of breeding and, and growing and maintaining chestnut plantings. Um, and also trying to get the public education aspect out there, letting people know what we're doing, why we're doing it, why it's important to bring the American chestnut back to our forests. Uh, and again, it's an all-volunteer effort, aside from myself and a few summer interns. Everyone who's working on chestnut with our program in New England, 95% of them are not being paid to do it. They're doing it because they want to and because they care about the uh, program, which is really uh, pretty, pretty cool to work with. Uh, and finally, ensuring long-term resistance. How do we do that? This is a little tougher. Uh, since 05, we've been producing trees that on that breeding chart have come all the way through all the generations of breeding and should be blight resistant or blight resistant enough to begin evolving on their own. That's kind of the hope is that we put these trees out and they can take care of themselves. Uh, but we need to actually put in some long-term tests to determine if that actually works. So I think since 08 or 09, in New England and possibly a third going into the spring. Um, but it's probably going to be another 15 to 20 years before we have really good data coming out of those tests to tell us, is this working well enough? Or do we need to do more work on the breeding side? How can we continue to improve our program? So with that, I wanted to kind of, that's sort of just the overview of what we do, and I wanted to focus in a little bit more on our state chapter breeding program. So is everyone still following along? We good? All right. So our state chapters get to kind of jump ahead in the breeding, which is nice. Um, it saves us a lot of time and <coughs> a lot of leg work. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a re uh, research farm in Meadowview, Virginia, and they have done a lot of breeding in these earlier generations. And so our state chapters generally start with this generation. We go out and find wild, last wild American chestnut that we'll cross with uh, in our program. And we have pollen from a second or third back cross generation shipped up to make those pollinations with. Um, so we at least don't have to do these few generations. All of this work is still lying ahead of us, but um, <laughs> at least we can, we can jumpstart a little bit. The general way that the chapter's field season works, um, I'm going to kind of just follow this sort of in our, uh, in the sort of sequence in which things generally happen, but uh, we receive a lot of reports of wild American chestnut trees. Some of them are Chinese chestnuts, some of them are not even chestnuts, um, but occasionally we do get wild American chestnuts that we pretty well verify are native to the state they're growing in. And so we're always trying to increase our inventory of American chestnut trees. If you find something that you think is chestnut, uh, we have a tree locator form online with some ID materials. I conduct leaf ID. There's a few other folks that will conduct these leaf and twig ID. We're always happy to gather those reports and increase our inventory. And from that, those reports, we're often looking for sort of the needle in the haystack, a good mother tree. And a mother tree is something that we can actually physically pollinate with some of this blight resistant pollen. Uh, so we're looking for something that's number one American chestnut, but we know is native to the state, it has to be flowering, or there's nothing for us to pollinate. And we have to be able to physically work with the flowers. So we need to actually touch all of those flowers to be able to pollinate them. We can do that with a bucket truck, sometimes we can do that with a ladder. 
cave and we do that with a tree climber. But sometimes the access is just, just makes it not possible. And so you have some trees out there that are it's nice to know they're there. There's really no good way for us to incorporate those in a breeding program. But generally, each chapter finds at least three to six trees free with um, in a given year. Some year they might, years they might even do a dozen trees. Uh, but this is sort of the first, this is how those, those backcross pollinations kind of come about. So there's a lot of legwork even before we even go out and start doing um, hands-on work. Control pollination is probably the coolest thing we do for field work, at least in my opinion. I don't know who else. I mean, a lot of people get to plant trees and, you know, grow things in gardens. Not a lot of people get to make trees. We make trees. It's cool. <laughs> so you don't have to work for four months. <laughs> Um, so the basic process is really based on the biology of the flowering of the American chestnut and, and, and the timing of how things develop. So in late June, the uh, American chestnut has male and female flowers in the same tree. So the pollen is collected off those male flowers. The female flowers are what we actually apply the pollen to. So the male flowers typically come out at their long catkin. They come out in June, and they kind of look like this yellowish shoestring for quite a while. And when they reach a certain point in development, when they're just starting to express the anthers, that's usually about the time that we go in and actually bag female flowers. We want to know if we're making a controlled cross that the nuts we harvest off of that cross came from pollen we put on the tree and not other pollen that might have been floating around. It's not very common to find flowering American chestnuts out there, but they are out there. So we want to make sure you know, this is a science program. We want to have test controls that we can. Um, so um, bagging before we pollinate is one of those controls. So we Remove the, the male flowers, it's something that is kind of unkind we call emasculation. Um, <laughs> and we put bags over the female flowers. These aren't anything particularly fancy. They're a corn shoe bag, they're just wax paper. They don't, they're not a real, real high tech, but they work really well. And then about 10 to 14 days later, the male flowers will be fully expressed. And then the female flowers, this little crown here, is uh, the receptive part of the female flower, the styles. And those kind of stick up and then spread out and turn yellowish, and that's how you know they're ready to be pollinated. This little green pineapple, it's probably the size of the tip of your finger, uh, is what becomes those big spiny burrs. Um, so they're kind of cute and friendly when they're in their world. Uh, and then we apply pollen. I use a, a glass microscope slide to just wipe pollen over the female flower. Some people like to dunk the, the flower into the pollen, make sure they get maximum contact with with this precious pollen. And then if we did everything like right, when we come back in late, August, late September, early October, the burrs are fully mature, uh, they're bursting through the bags, and they're full of uh, viable chestnut seeds that we can plant. Um, so as I said, so the, um, this is the wild American chestnut that we might find. This is the cross that we're making. And then where do those go? They go um, all these 15, 16 certain um, third bat cross trees get planted in something that we call a breeding orchard. You guys will see an example of that on your field trip this afternoon. Um, there's a little nice little picture of Leila. Um, this is a, so a breeding orchard, basically what we're looking for, we want to grow seeds, we want to grow them well, we want to grow them fairly quickly, so we want to plant them on site so they know we are going to support chestnut. So that includes full sun, well drained soil, slightly acidic soil pH, um, about 5.5 five seems to be about this sweet spot, 5 to 5.5. Five. Um, and the protection from wildlife, just about anything that will eat plants will eat chestnuts and they find them quite tasty. And we also need appropriate management and care available for at least 15 years. A breeding program we expect to be about a 15 year project from the time we plant to the time we actually harvest these full nuts from the next generation breeding out of them. So we grow the seedlings till they're about an inch and a half to three inches in diameter and actually challenge them with chestnut light. So we get poke holes in the stem on all the trees and it can physically infect them with chestnut light. And that's how we tell if they've got enough resistance or not to continue our breeding program. And so we select the trees based on light resistance. Um, once we've whittled it down based on light resistance, we look at about 15 to 20 morphological traits that look more like American chestnut than Chinese chestnut. We want to select trees that look and act like American chestnut kind of going on the, if it looks like a duck and acts like a duck, it's a duck. We yeah. want, want American chestnuts, not um, obvious hundreds. And then the trees we select are allowed to open pollinate and actually produce nuts for the next generation of breeding. So from the breeding orchard, when we make these selections, we have representatives of both of, of these lines that are allowed to open pollinate. And so where do those go? Well, actually, back up. Um, so when we make these, um, these breeding selections, all the other trees are rogue or removed. This is actually a huge amount of work. 
Typically, our breeding orchards are home to three to 500 breeds, and when we're done selecting them, they're home to maybe 12. On a, a good site, maybe eight. Um, and so there's a lot of trees to remove. Some of them will die off of attrition over time. Um, some of them are obviously not very good. But you know, there's a lot of trees to pull out of the ground. Chestnuts are really effective at re-sprouting, so dealing with that aftermath of these trees continually coming back up um, is also uh, interesting to deal with. But ultimately, we end up with, with a few really good trees that are selected to open pollinate, and they actually start to produce a lot of nuts. This is um, this is Brian Clark's refrigerator that I think has room for maybe one or two growlers of beer, but it's mostly <laughs> um, And those are all high, high quality B3F2 nuts that were, um, that were produced from open pollination in his um, breeding orchard that represent a few different lines of wild trees from Massachusetts. So we've got these open pollinating trees producing. Where do those seeds go? Brad mentioned a little bit about seed orchards, and I'm going to try to explain a little bit more about them. The main difference between, one, one of the big differences between a seed orchard and a breeding orchard that is a little bit more challenging for us right now is that a breeding orchard, we're kind of done with in about 15 years. A seed orchard, we're looking for management and care available for 30 to 45 years. I've barely been alive that long. <laughs> this is a long-term project, and so we're, you know, putting one of these things in someone's backyard and expecting that they're going to be around to take care of it 45 years from now is, is kind of a tough assumption to make. So we're really starting to look at more long-term partnerships where we can have a plan for succession of management and know that someone will be around to take care of these trees and, and deal with the harvesting and everything else that's going to go along with that um, in, in years to come, or most of us probably won't still be involved with this project. Um, the seed orchards represent, um, are a collection that represent all of the breeding lines from a given source of resistance that are created in the chapter. So a breeding orchard might have three breeding lines in it. The seed orchard will have all 20 that we created, and so it takes a long time to fill those in. Uh, we plant them on much denser spacing, and we're expecting much higher levels of resistance from these trees. So we actually only let them get to about an inch in diameter before we start infecting them with chestnut blight. It's probably going to be a, so a two-step process of using a weaker strain, pulling some trees out, using a stronger strain, and then making our ultimate selection. Um, so it's going to take a little bit more time in that regard as well. But if we do it right, our seed orchards are going to produce uh, this B3F3 generation, which at least on paper, will be appropriate for, um, for planting in forests. And so we're really hopeful that that, that will work. Uh, and I don't know if you can, you probably can't read this, but this is what this said. The final intercross is expected to show a high level of bright resistance in initial forest as planting. So this was the, that, that's what our breeding program has been since the, the mid 80s. Um, and we may need to update that at some point. But uh, at least for now, that's what we're running with. Um, so that, that's sort of our breeding program as a, at least a snapshot. Is everyone have any questions before continue on? Yes. There, there's a number of uh, institutional things in Massachusetts, trustees and Nature Conservancy. Have any of those signed up or bought in or? Um, yes, to some extent. I mean, we're still starting. We've only, I'll, I'll go through where we have worked so far okay. in Massachusetts and where we're, we're looking at them, but it's a, it's a pretty wide range of um, municipalities, agencies, land trusts, universities, yeah. Um, yeah. some private landowners with conservation easements yeah. um, that are just held maybe by a land trust. Um, but yeah, we're, we're just starting to get into it in Massachusetts so bit in Rhode Island, so we'll start knocking on doors just, a little harder. Just to put a reminder in, it's the labor that's important. It is. It's fairly easy for us oh, yeah. to get the land. Oh yeah? Okay. Yeah, a lot of people will let you grow trees on their property, not as many want to take Really, with that 30-year commitment, though? Yeah. Well, easement. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There, there's some complications there. Uh, all right, so I'm going to briefly go through what's going on in our other chapters beyond Massachusetts before we, we really focus in on where we are today. Uh, our main chapter was established in 1998. Um, I didn't actually get an updated number from them. I don't think they harvested quite that much. But their goal was to breed 20 lines of both our graves and clapper sources of resistance. Um, they've currently inoculated and selected approximately half of the lines in for both of those sources of resistance, so they're really moving along pretty quickly with their, their next phase of breeding. And they have six seed orchard sites established, which actually will accommodate all of the blocks of seed orchard that they need to plant. That's 18 acres or 18 blocks of seed orchard. Um, so they have a lot of planting on their plate for next year. I think they've got probably maybe more like 10,000 seeds they'll be planting um, next, next spring. 
Uh, just to give you a highlight and sort of an overview of where all those sites are, because it's probably the most interesting thing going on in Maine right now. Uh, the Basin Preserve is a nature conservancy property in Phippsburg, Maine. It's home to two blocks of their clapper orchard. Uh, they planted five plots in each of those blocks in uh, 2012, um, but no planting last year. They have any new seed to plant. Now, probably didn't explain this earlier, a plot in a seed orchard is 150 nuts on close spacing, and there's 20 of those plots that make up a block. That was sort of the little diagram that, um, that Brad showed in his talk. Uh, so five plots times 150 nuts per plot times two blocks. That was a lot of nuts. <laughs> uh, they do have a deer fence, and they'll probably be planting another 10 or 20 lines or new plots in each of, each of those two blocks um, in the spring. Their Huff Hill Orchard is on University of Maine property in Heartland, Maine. Um, it was gifted to the university with the intention to do tree research and then just sat as a field that a lot of people like to go deer hunting in. So now it's, it's actually being used for the purpose it was meant for. And our main chapter has actually five blocks of trees up there. Uh, this is actually oops, what a single plot looks like. It's a pretty tree type spacing. So that's 150 trees right there. Um, I think I've probably got a picture later on that shows what they look like after a year or two. Um, but so they'll be, they've planted a lot already and they'll be doing a significant uh, amount of planting again next, next spring. Uh, their PCCA or Penobscot County Conservation Association orchards in Stetson, there's actually two different sites. They establish uh, four blocks, three blocks a couple years ago and, and two more this past spring. Um, and actually this year at planting they had a uh, killed year nest. Mm -hmm. uh, especially where I don't know if you can tell there's corn. <laughs> so <laughs> take a week to get. Uh, the Swome orchards are new this year. Swome is the Small Woodland Owners of Maine Association. Association of Maine? Yeah. Um, and they planted four blocks this past spring. I actually just saw these Thursday afternoon and the, the tallest trees are actually about 30 inches, no, about three feet. Three feet. Yeah, they're about this tall. They've done things remarkably well. They were planted as direct seed. Um, and in addition, there's probably an, one more block they might establish with the, with, uh, the Forest Service on an experimental forest in Alfred, Maine. Um, so certainly they have their, um, their planting here sort of already um, real up to go in their spring. Our Vermont New Hampshire chapter uh, is another joint state chapter family here. Uh, they were established in 2008. They're our youngest state chapter. And they're currently just planning to, uh, to breed 20 lines of the greatest source of resistance. So they're just focusing on one source. Uh, they pollinated nine wild American chestnuts in 2013. A lot of those were for their local breeding program, but they also um, pollinated three of those for a phytophthora root rot resistance program that our, uh, our research farm in Meadowview is kind of leading, uh, along with, with some really great volunteer input from uh, some folks in, in the Carolinas chapter. So we actually made a few crosses for that work as well. Uh, and so in, in 2014, we're hoping to be able to finish the breeding work in Vermont, New Hampshire, and, um, and focus more on, uh, on new orchards. Planted three new breeding orchards this, this spring in Bristol, New Hampshire, Pulteney, Vermont, and Jamaica, Vermont. Also put in a test planting at Burke Forest that will hopefully become an orchard in, the, uh, in 2014. And a progeny test of our most resistant material from Meadowview actually went in on the Green Mountain National Forest um, in Goshen, Vermont. Um, on the Green Mountain National Forest, one of the interesting projects that's actually developed in the past few years is we've started um, reading phenology. Uh, the Green Mountain National Forest, so there's this project test we just put in, so there's an existing plantation that includes 13 different genetic sources of, of pure American chestnut that are, were collected from sort of across the range. So we've got some sources from the north, some from the central portion of the range, and some from the south. And so we've gone out actually weekly from before bud break to full leaf out and, um, and rated uh, the leaf out rate of the different trees down there um, and just sort of started looking for patterns. And interestingly, both the past two years we've been doing this, we've had a significant frost either early or late in the season that set back one group of trees or another. So we're seeing some interesting patterns uh, with that work. And finally, Connecticut. This is a little shorter one. Our Connecticut chapter was established in 1991. They actually didn't begin really actively breeding until about 2005. And so they've been working on actually 20 lines of clapper source of resistance, which they always get kind of a kick out of because the greatest source of resistance was developed in Connecticut. So maybe we're deciding to use the clapper source to give it a little more variation down there. 
Um, they've created 24 lines to date. Seven of those are, are on the small side, but we're moving between, you know, with, with the whole collection, we'll get some good selections. And we'll actually start inoculating two of their orchards um, this coming spring. So they're just starting to think about seed orchards, but we'll just start establishing those in the next couple of years. Um, yeah, as I said, their, their orchards are trying to get big. We've updated all the inventories this year. That was one of the big projects. And we're probably going to be looking at some progeny testing with the land trust in the southwest corner of the state. Um, so right now they're really focusing on growing the trees in their orchards and they're trying to get some demonstration and outreach planning things out um, just to kind of keep people interested in their program. So that was it for the New England update. I think there's a technically a second thing on the agenda, which is the Master Island update. So before I transition to there, are we still good? Any questions? Mike? Yes. Since Maine is getting all these seed orchards, how are they handling the labor problem? <laughs> Well, um, with the Phippsburg site with the Nature Conservancy, they actually have a good volunteer base there and the Nature Conservancy folks have been handling most of that. The Swollen Properties have had a good base um, to a volunteer base of their own that's been able to help monitor. Um, PCCA in Stetson, the Penobscot County Conservation Association, they also have a pretty good volunteer base. Um, and then Huff Hill has a lot less uh, of a volunteer base. They've actually hired a full-time intern the past two summers that generally maintains that Huff Hill Orchard and some of the others in sort of the Bangor, northern uh, Maine area. I think there's some thought that maybe they need that to do that in the mid-coast area because they're kind of split between those two geographic regions. Uh, but the majority of the technical management and expertise is still coming from the chapter. Uh, so you know, hopefully as those relationships develop over time, some of the, the work will be better dispersed. Um, because they, they, they planted some pretty big sites. They're some pretty ambitious planting. They're already looking a little scary and they're not even close to full. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, so I'm going to transition out of the, the Master Island chapter and, and tell you a little bit more detail what was going on um, down here this year. This is actually a map of all of our, our orchards, and I apologize it hasn't been updated in a couple of years, so there might be a few missing sites. But um, we have a lot of, a lot of chestnut trees in the ground in Master Island. Uh, so the chapter was established in 2001, some of you were a part of that, which is great that you're still involved, and uh, the goal has been to breed 20 lines in both the clapper and grave sources of resistance, and we've met and surpassed that goal, and then also started doing a little bit of breeding with the Nanking source of resistance, uh, which is a newer one of the, the research farm. And I mentioned earlier, the Vermont New Hampshire chapter helped with some of the, the phytophthora process, we've also helped with those processes in Massachusetts. Um, we really seem to like breeding trees with this chapter, which is great. It's a great way to keep people actively involved. Um, so we're generally doing something with pollination every year. Uh, spring, pl spring planting this past spring, the focus was really on getting our seed orchard planted. Um, we have three sites. The South Kingstown Land Trust site that you had a full visit this afternoon um, was actually their first planting two, two years ago, uh, but they put three new plots in this past spring. Um, Smith College has a new seed orchard on their McLeish Field Station in Waitley, and they planted, I think, two plots mm -hmm. um, in the spring with a lot of help from, uh, three. was it three? Yeah. Oh, I'll have to fix that. <laughs> um, we're still gathering all of our data. It's that time of year, so my records aren't perfect. Um, so that, that was a significant planting that shows deer fence up, irrigation system in, and that's a nice site with a lot of opportunity for student involvement. Um, and then our Granville Orchard, which is a grave source of resistance, we've had less material from those orchards planted seed orchards at this point, so we just have one partial plot that was planted in the spring. We'll probably start filling that in a little bit better next year. And I think this is actually, this is the Smith station, the Smith uh, planting. Uh, in addition, we did harvest a couple of Nanking lines last fall, so there was a little bit of Nanking planting that happened this spring. Um, some of those went in at, at Brian's Orchard in, in Ashfield, Mass, and a few more went in in uh, an existing breeding orchard in Lincoln, Mass. Uh, so we've got uh, a little bit more of the breeding orchard stuff going on. As far as breeding selections, this has been a lot of the work that we've been doing <coughs> Um, when you inoculate orchards, then you have to go and figure out what are the best trees, and that's not a real quick thing to do. It takes several visits over about a year and a half to two years. So this summer we did we rated at our Sterling Orchard, our Grafton Orchard, our Moore State Park Orchard, our Asheville Holly Orchard, Granville, and Medway. 
And all of those orchards, with the exception of Med Medway and Asheville Collie, are fully selected and grown so that they can open pollinate, which is a lot less work. Um, Medway and Asheville Collie, was, they were planted over enough of a difference in time where we had to stagger our inoculations, which means that if we want open pollination to happen, we actually have to go in and emasculate all of the flowering trees that aren't breeding selections, which is an awful lot of work. If you want to know how much work it is, you can talk to Brian and then talk to him. <laughs> Uh, so we also inoculated some more orchards because why not? <laughs> Let's keep things moving. So we inoculated an orchard in Conway, Mass, and one in Weston, one in Lunenburg, um, and also finished off inoculation in Medway and Nashville Poly so that we can get those orchards fully selected and roved out and, and stop making people do extra work. Uh, we inoculate the trees in early June, or late June to early July, basically when the trees are fully leafed out. Um, infecting trees with chestnut blade is a stressful thing to do to them. So if they've got their leaves fully out, they at least have their full complement of, of sort of resources to battle that, um, that infection. We make our initial ratings in November, and at this point we only have two orchards left to rate. Um, I need to get out to Lindenburg and out to Medway, which will hopefully get done before Thanksgiving. So a little more travel for me next week. Um, and it's a big job to get these inoculations done, so if any of you here were involved with any of those inoculations, thank you. Charlotte definitely helped coordinate a lot of that work down here, um, which was a huge help to me. Thanks, Charlotte. Um, and a lot of our, our members are, are learning how to do this work pretty well, so uh, we've got a pretty good crew of, of trained volunteers in this, this um, method, which is kind of an important thing uh, within the past few years. Also did some control pollinations because we like making baby trees. Uh, we made two Nan King crosses, or at least attempted two this year. One in Southborough, we had some contamination in the control bags. We just figured we, the pollination happened a little late, so we're not going to use those. But um, Brian Clark out in Windsor did uh, a cross on a, a wild tree that we've, we've worked with for a couple years. We got 109 nuts off of that. And we also made six crosses for the phytophthora work that I mentioned earlier. Uh, one was a tree in Saundertown, Rhode Island, that Yvonne took on right after getting back from a European trip. So she was a busy gal in July. Um, I'm going to keep bringing up Brian. It's, it's very fitting that he got a volunteer award this year because he made five crosses in his orchard um, for this, this project as well. And bonus was that we got actually a little bit more than we needed off of this cross, so we were able to send some of these nuts um, down for that project as well. So there's actually seven crosses that came out of um, Massachusetts that will be used for screening trees for phytophthora resistance. Um, do you guys know what phytophthora is? Phytophthora root rot actually is a pathogen on chestnut roots that came into the U.S. long before chestnut blight, probably in the early 1800s maybe. And um, it's also called ink disease, and it kills the root system. They, they turn black and the tree dies. Um, chestnut blight doesn't kill the roots, and chestnut's a great root sprouter, so we have a sort of a bonus that chestnut blight still leaves it with genetic material to work with. Phytophthora does not do that. Um, so in the south, where this is a big problem, uh, we really want to start looking at, to breed trees that are resistant. So um, it's, I think it's great that our New England chapters, who are probably the farthest from worrying about this at this point, um, are really trying to make an effort to, to help with that, that program. Uh, in terms of open pollinated harvest, um, we harvested out of our Tower Hill orchard, which I'm sorry, Brad, I'm giving you a question. Five to six hundred. Okay, five to six hundred for this one. Uh, we got over 2,000 from Lincoln Orchard. The Wayland Orchard only had about 600, but this orchard we've had to do as control, uh, control process, which is a lot more work and you get a lot less production. Um, just the timing of when those selections have come into flower hasn't been synchronous enough to allow them to open pollinate, which makes for a little extra work. Um, you can see everyone else is, uh, is getting a little bit more production. So we've had over, over 13,000 nuts out of our clapper orchard. And for our, our graves orchards, which are smaller um, and have less lines and are, are um, newer to production, Granville just started producing next year, uh, we've got um, almost 3,000 nuts. So certainly plenty of material to plant next year. Planning for spring planting. So again, seed orchards are going to be our big focus. Uh, we're going to continue filling in established seed orchard plots, and then we have a lot of new possibilities that may or may not work out by the end of, or by the time we're ready to start putting things in the ground. Um, we're going to say Pittsfield Mass, which is with the town of Pittsfield. Orange Mass is with a, a landowner whose land is in a conservation easement with a local land trust that hopefully has some um, volunteer base to, to work with. Weston is on Lands Safe Property, which is a, another nonprofit that does sort of farm education, I believe. 
and um, they're interested in actually repurposing one of their breeding orchards. Oxford and Uxbridge, Mass. are actually both Army Corps of Engineers um, sites that we would really like to see work out uh, with some of the issues with government um, budgets and funding and the availability of, of workers. It's been a little tough to, um, to kind of get those ones off the ground. Uh, Coal Rain, Mass. I believe, is on private land. Stockbridge Mass would be something where we're trying to see if we can work something out with the Laurel Hill Association and, and Stockbridge Land Trust. And New Grain Tree Mass, I'm not as familiar with. I think it's a tree farm site. Where's the low it? Is it tree farm? Yes. Yeah. Um, so this would be another potential partnership for us. But with all these, we've got a lot of work to do over the winter. Um, first and foremost, we need some type of an agreement in place so that everyone knows what everyone else is doing. I think, as I mentioned earlier, it's a 30 to 45 year project, so we're not just going to camp people some nuts in the spring and, and just cross our fingers. <laughs> um, it's good to have a management plan in place so it's very clear what uh, what work is, is, is going to be done and needs to be done. Um, in some cases, we need to start looking for some funding for deer fences or planting supplies and um, and plan for the site prep and other planning that goes into um, making these, these sites ready to plant. So um, we've got plenty of work to do this winter. We're kind of done with our field season. It's sort of maybe a month to catch our breath and then, <laughs> then we can focus on, on these kinds of things. Um, so that, that was sort of the, the update there and then I wanted to actually just spend like five minutes going through options for the types of plantings we're looking for hosts for in Mass and Rhode Island, um, just in case anyone has a nice site in mind or a project that they're interested in. But before I do that, any questions on our, our very busy breeding season? Okay, cool. So for chestnut plantings, there's several different things that we can do in Massachusetts. Clearly from what we just talked about, seed orchards are our big focus right now. We really need seed orchard sites with, uh, with a good volunteer base and, and long-term stability. Uh, but in addition, we do um, some demonstration and ceremonial plantings every year. Um, we've done a few small forest establishment studies. Um, breeding orchards, we may still be looking for one or two more sites for those. Possibly, we're probably kind of ramping those down. Um, but then again, seed orchards are the big thing, but there's different sort of parameters that go along with each of these, these sites that um, make them better or worse. Um, for any chestnut planting, we want well-drained soil. If you plant chestnut in a wet site, it will die. I've seen it happen. It happens. Don't plant chestnut in a wet spot. Uh, slightly acidic soil is good. pH of about 5, 5 seems to be kind of a sweet spot, but anywhere in the 4.5 and 6.5 and range seems to work out okay. Um, full to partial sun, if you want the trees to flower, they need a lot of sun. They won't flower in the shade. So for breeding purposes, we really need open sites that, that have access to sunlight. Um, protection from vegetation competition is a big deal. Um, grass will kill young chestnut trees if it's allowed to um, encroach upon them. Uh, we've got short critters. Voles in particular, um, especially the old apple orchard sites or other places where voles are kind of running rampant, they really like chestnut roots. And if you've got landscape fabric down or something like that, they will figure out that there's a tasty snack every seven feet, and we'll just <laughs> walk around. Um, mice can be a problem, rabbits, woodchucks, porcupines. Um, shortly after planting, uh, raccoons can actually be really devastating. Um, and then deer love chestnuts. Uh, one of my coworkers likes to say that they're like Kit Kats for deer. Um, they, if they are a problem in your area, once they develop a taste for chestnut, they won't leave your orchard alone. So um, protection or deterrent of some sort is kind of uh, important. As far as demonstration and ceremonial plantings are concerned, we're looking generally for sites that have either some education potential to get the story out there and, and allow more people to learn about the American chestnut, or has some publicity potential, if you get a good story for the newspaper and we can get the story out there that way and, and expose more people to our mission. Um, or sometimes just to um, to thank someone or, or an organization that has really um, supported us in the past is sort of a nice thank you that we can do. Um, or a site that has all of the above, that's even, that's even a better fit. Um, but these are generally plantings of maybe five of our highly resistant trees, um, or our potentially highly resistant trees. They're still for testing, our B3F trees aren't guaranteed to be blight resistant. They're also not guaranteed to die of chestnut blight, which you can kind of guarantee for American chestnut. So <coughs> that's a little bit better than, than what we used to be able to say. And uh, you know, for education planting, sometimes we might include other species, uh, just to kind of um, broaden what, what a visitor might be exposed to. Um, 
As far as forest establishment sites, we're generally looking for sites that provide the opportunity for us to test establishment practices that we might try in a larger, um, when we really get to the point of sort of Johnny Appleseed getting chestnuts out in the forest, um, there's a lot of different ways you can plant chestnuts, so if we can start testing things now to see what works, what doesn't, um, we'll have looked at a bunch of different, um, different things, and uh, generally those types of plantings, pedigree isn't as important, so a lot of times we use pure American or unselected materials, um, if it's a planting that we expect to, to stick around for a long time and has other goals, we might use um, breeding material. Um, as far as the breeding program goes, a breeding orchard, again, generally about an acre and a half in size. We plant three to five hundred trees and it's a 10 to 15 year project. Um, this is where we grow our, our back cross lines. Um, I don't think we're in need of too many more of these sites in Massachusetts, um, but they are sort of a, a step down from seed orchards in terms of, in terms of the time commitment that goes into them, uh, at least long term. And then finally, a seed orchard. We're looking for an appropriate site to grow chestnut that's available for 30 to 45 years, that has a committed orchard manager, and some plan for that orchard manager's succession is ideal. Um, you don't have to necessarily come up with all that at the beginning, but um, it's really good to talk about up front. Uh, they need to be at least an acre. One block fits on one acre. You can't break a block into any smaller pieces, so you can go up in units of a block, so you can potentially plant a two acre site. Um, but it needs to be at least one acre. Um, accessible for planting, maintenance and upkeep. The easier it is to get to the site, the, the more likely it is to be taken care of. Uh, water needs to be available in some way, and um, the purpose is to actually grow our V3F2 lines so we can produce V3F3s or our final generation of seed available for forest planting. So the, the ultimate goal of the seed orchard is actually um, a, a pretty exciting one. Finally, if you guys aren't sick of chestnut meetings at the end of today, we'll have another one. Uh, I host a regional meeting every year this year. We're going to be meeting back at the Urban Forestry Center in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Um, New England is bigger and harder to navigate than it seems like it should be. Portsmouth is about three hours from most points uh, or less. So we'll be looking, actually we'll spend the morning uh, on a workshop with our trees database. This is an online database we've been developing for what seems like decades, but it's been at least three years. <laughs> um, and it's actually at the point where it's somewhat functional and we can start using it for dumping our data into it and, and answering some questions. Um, I actually apologize, I haven't changed my presentation. Paul was going to give a presentation on the research project at Smith. We're, we're not sure if that's going to happen or what we're doing there. Um, we are going to also look at the Chestnut Learning Box. I think you guys have one on display here, right? Um, this is a really great educational resource, and I think a lot of our chapters see all the shiny, exciting hands-on things and don't realize the value of the educational material that's in there. These are great for um, environmental learning centers and um, even classrooms. So we'll spend a little time going through those in more detail. And then actually I have a coworker coming up from Pennsylvania who's going to lead some strategic planning discussion, and, and that's definitely something our chapters um, could use some, some help figuring out how to do. Not necessarily a lot of fun, but necessarily, but it's an important thing, so I will learn a little bit like, about that. If you want to come, shoot me an email. I just need to know so that I can order enough lunch for everyone, and um, it would be great to have you there. And I think that's it. Mike. Kendra, did you leave out as a type of thing in province testing sites? I did. I forgot. Yeah. We also do provenance uh, or progeny test sites. Um, those typically are three to five hundred trees, um, and that's where we're testing our B3F3s. Um, doesn't necessarily have to be quite as manicured a site as an orchard, um, but uh, it's where we're, we're looking for at least to collect data for 15 to 20 years on, on how these trees perform without a lot of manipulation. It's less work. Yeah, you're, you're probably not, you're not going to inoculate them, you're not going to rope them, you're kind of going to let nature do what it will. Just, just a comment. Um, Kendra listed a kind of long list of scary things that you might have to be responsible for if you have an orchard on your property. But uh, all of us started out from ground zero at some point, and we, we guarantee that we would talk with you a great deal before you actually committed to see you know, if, if you had the resources and so on that uh, were required. In addition, you'd get lots of on-hand support, I'm sure, for at least the first few years. And I know, unfortunately, I got one of my orchards, and I'm got to the point now I'm traveling a lot and the chapter has supported me even though I've had the, the, the orchard for 10 years. 
Uh, so there is a lot of, of support that's provided, so it's not uh, something you uh, take on yeah, entirely. Yeah, no, we own. don't just like give you an orchard and then disappear. Yeah. <laughs> we try to communicate <laughs> on a regular basis. Yeah, in terms of the support um, available, we have a wonderful um, New England science. I am rarely home with all. And we have um, a wonderful um, chapter to range from professor of genetics to um, people involved in you know, agriculture and tree farming. And all the way to librarians. Yeah, Pardon? library science. All the way to librarians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> People who play them on TV. And, um, um, but we also have a list serve that, on which you can ask questions, um, which is read by the national staff, including the um, research staff down in Virginia. Um, and there are, are many scientists across the country involved in this project who there's another uh, mailing list you can ask even more questions of. And uh, we have meetings you can come and, you know, um, be involved with. So the, um, also we, we come and help plant the new orchards. You're not on your own for planting and for learning the techniques. So we, we've been involved. Um, chapter members have come and helped every new um, planting that's happened. Yeah. And we, we come and do the inoculations. Yeah, and you don't have to do all that projects. yourself. Yeah, you don't have to do all this yourself. But but the day to day, like watching the trees, some, you know, every week or so, oh, half of them have ear brows on, you know, this week. So maybe some dabbing on some ear guard. Involved. You know, that kind of thing is what the, the local people are really needed for. And, you know, of course we have, you know, many groups who do amazing work, too, um, on the seed orchards, like the URI Master Gardeners, who come out in, in large groups, have wonderful picnics, and um, get lots of work done. I don't see any more hands, so if you have other questions, feel free to track me down, but I think it's public time. Okay. It's public time? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Before you get to eat the pop up, okay, there is an amazing silent auction over there to benefit the chapter's work. Um, beautiful um, and chestnut items from people in the chapter. And, um, the silent auction works by, if you haven't seen it before, you write down your name in a bid, and if somebody outbids you, you know, they're going to get it. So you can wash your item and make sure that you don't get outbid and you don't get fired. And uh, the um, silent auction will end at a quarter of the suit, so we'll be pulling the sheets, okay? So you have a nice long lunch, just enjoy the day, talk to people, ask questions. Um, I was curious to the items that they had chestnuts. Oh, actually, the air and chestnuts? Yes, I believe the um, guy made most of it. Yeah, I think they're from a, an American chestnut that had to be that so I would like. Yeah, I realized it's probably a